So uh, the next speaker is Dr. Ines Thomas. She is the director of the uh, Pediatric uh, Diabetes Program at the University of Michigan. And she's a good friend of mine. I knew her since she was a resident in the, in the program. And uh, I am very excited that she is um, part of the CF care um, and, and uh, CF help for, for us. So uh, Dr. Thomas, if you wanted to uh, take it from there. Thank you. All right. So thank you so much for having me. So I would like to bring you up to kind of our new CFRD management in 2020. This is Blue. You will see him a couple times in this presentation. He is our diabetes monster. And you can find him on our website, umpdiabetes.com, if you need to find some more information about diabetes. So first, I want to just talk about why it's important to talk about CFRD. It is the most common associated disease in people with cystic fibrosis, occurring in about 20% of adolescents and about 40 to 50% of adults. So if CFRD is not treated um, completely efficiently, it can lead to poor pulmonary function, shorter lifespan, and poor growth in nutrition. But the good news is this is a very treatable and manageable disease, but it's important for us to treat it aggressively and early. When we talk about CFRD, the first thing a lot of families will ask is, is what type is it? Because they've heard the terms type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes implies that it's an autoimmune disorder that happens in adolescents, although it can have adults on um, onset. It is due to the beta cells being destroyed in the pancreas, which leads to um, a lack of insulin production. And so in this situation, the individuals are, our goal is to have just normal nutrition, with um, we monitor the carbohydrates and give them insulin. This compares type two. Type two diabetes happens a lot in adults. It can happen in children, but it mostly happens in adults, and it's not autoimmune. In this situation, the insulin production is actually higher. The body doesn't respond to insulin correctly. In this situation, they're called insulin resistant versus insulin insufficient. Um, this is why you can start treating type 2 diabetes with pills, because you're trying to make the body use the insulin that it has. And if that's not enough, then we can switch to different types of medication, sometimes leading back to insulin. And so CFRD is kind of a combination of both. There is both insulin insufficiency and there's insulin resistance. And then there's some factors of itself that are totally unique to CFRD that makes it a little bit different to treat. So just to kind of go through the slide, I'm not going to go through all of it, but just to kind of show you an example of why we think this is um, happens this way. Although I will say that the pathophysiology of the CFRD is still not fully understood. So we know because of the defective CTFR, there leads to be thick and viscous secretions, which then obstructs the ducts in the pancreas, leading to inflammation and problems with the beta cell both functioning and being lost. So both of these will lead to insulin insufficiency. At the same time, there is pancreatic insufficiency leading to fat malabsorption, undernutrition, and infection inflammation, and sometimes needing corticosteroids. And all of these factors lead to insulin resistance. So between the insulin resistance and insulin insufficiency, we have CFRD. And then there's a whole factor over here on this side that's not well understood yet, and there is research being done to figure this out. So CFRD increases by age. So less than 10 years old, it's a very small percentage. But once you get to about 10 to 19 years old, it's about 19 to 20%. And it goes up every, it goes up by a certain percentage every decade. So by the time 40 year old, you get to 40 years old, more than 50% will have a CFRD, and the majority of it will be in the severe genotype. You know. And so this um, was the reason we created these new Michigan Medicine Guidelines. The one with the goal of aggressively treating, treating CFRD to improve overall health, which will then optimize lung function, growth, and BMI, all areas that um, Dr. Nasser and Dr. Simon talked about a minute ago, and also to improve and align the communication between pediatric endocrinology and pediatric pulmonology. So that the goal would be that we are on the same page and we are telling you the same things and helping you um, navigate your medical care. So screening starts on the pulmonary side with annual screening at age 10 years old. However, if there are concerns, their uh, screening can start earlier. 
So the symptoms of CFRD can be the same symptoms as regular type 1 or type 2 diabetes, which means increased urination, increased thirst, and that's the term polyuria and polydipsia. Um, if there's failure to gain weight, maintain weight, there's poor growth velocity, they're not going to puberty normally, or if there's unexplained decline in pulmonary function, those are all reasons to screen for diabetes earlier. At the same time, if there's an active illness requiring IV antibiotics or steroids, it is recommended to screen. And the reason behind this is if the beta cells are healthy, they can, re they can handle the, in the illness and the infection and increase the insulin needed to keep the blood sugars normal. But if they're starting to not work as well as they should, an active illness can sometimes cause um, the blood sugars to go high. And that's a sign that there's something happening in the background that we need to be aware of. So when, we, so when we're looking at diagnosis of CFRD, the recommendation is to do an oral glucose tolerance test, which uses that very sweet, syrupy drink. And this is based on your weight. So we dose it um, based on the child's weight. So before we start talking about the classes of CFRD, I want to make sure, bring you to attention to what is normal um, blood sugars and what is the definition of diabetes. So diabetes, a fasting, is fasting plasma glucose greater than 126, or a random plasma glucose greater than 200. And so normal glucose tolerance, meaning there's no concern, is a fasting plasma glucose less than 100, and a two-hour post-glucose um, um, drink of less than 140. After that, then it becomes a kind of a little bit um, iffy and more concerning that things are not quite normal. So if the blood sugar is above 100 but less than 126 and less than 140, but at some time during the test the blood sugar got above 200, that is concerning that, again, things are not quite as healthy as they could be. And that's, and that's called intradermal glycemia. If the blood sugar is less than 100 but it gets to be 140 to 199, again, it's considered impaired glucose tolerance because not quite healthy. Then when you are diagnosed with CFRD, it's usually due to either a, uh, um, a two-hour blood sugar greater than 200 or a fasting blood sugar greater than 126, but the factor, there's another factor that's not quite there. This needs to be treated carefully and aggressively due to all the increased risk. So the diagnosis is based on two abnormal glucoses on two separate days. And the diagnosis date is when the criteria is met, even if the um, uh, individual has not started insulin or the insulin does not continue. So in healthy outpatients, we do an oral glucose tolerance test, and we use a fasting plasma glucose greater than 126, a two-hour OGTD greater than 200, an A1C greater than 6.5%, and we'll talk about that in a second, or a random glucose greater than 200 with them. So all but number four should be repeated because if you have random glucose and symptoms, that is very concerning, um, and we need to treat that immediately. If a child has acute illness or systemic steroids, we have to have abnormal blood sugars for greater than 48 hours, and so we can, and that will be the diagnosis date when that happens. If a person is on continuous drip feeds or um, two feeds, it's a blood sugar greater than 200, and again, it has to be confirmed on two different nights. So once you have this diagnosis, it's very hard to tell, are we doing okay? How are the blood sugars doing? And so what we use is something called an A1C. So hemoglobin A1C is the amount of glucose that's attached to the red blood cells, the hemoglobin of red blood cells, and red blood cells last about three months. So the A1C is a three-month measure. And so normal A1C is less than 6.5%. However, once you are diagnosed and on treatment, the goal is to stay less than 7% and preferably as low as possible with being healthy. And so this is something we will personalize the person's um, uh, situation. So the treatment of CFRD is threefold. We need monitoring of blood sugars. We need to have good nutrition. And then we need medication as needed. And unfortunately in CFRD, the medication that we do recommend is insulin because of the insulin insufficiency that happens. There are definitely studies out there that are trying to use oral medications, and there has been some progress, but in pediatrics or in children, we always use insulin. And so the way we monitor is by checking a blood sugar. And so this is a, um, a glucometer. Finger is poked, and you measure the blood sugar. 
when we are trying to figure out how much insulin um, a person needs, we usually have them start checking multiple times a day. And we have them check before meals, sometimes after meals, overnight, um, just depending on what we are trying to figure out. Once we know how much insulin a person needs, we usually have them check four blood sugars a day. And that's usually before breakfast, before lunch, before dinner, and before bedtime. Once we have been checking for a certain time and there is a routine, we are sometimes able to get individuals what we call continuous glucose monitors. And there are two main ones on the market right now. Um, there is another one, but that one's specific to a pump. This one is called a Libre. So you can see the disc on the arm, and then this is basically a fancy glucometer. So this glucometer, you, you put it over the disc, and it tells you what your blood sugar is, and it actually tells you what's happening to the blood sugar. So in this situation, the individual's blood sugar is 181 with an arrow up, meaning the blood sugar is going up. And the newest one that just came out a couple months ago now sends this information to your phone. So if your child is scanning, it'll send the information to a parent's phone. So this is quite um, cool. This one is called a Dexcom. This device also sits on the skin. And this device sends the information directly to the phone. And it's reading blood sugars every five minutes. And so this, again, helps you um, determine how to dose your insulin. Both of these devices do replace checking your finger. However, it is recommended that you check your finger if the blood sugar is low or if the blood sugar is really high or does not seem to match the number on the screen. And so the question for a lot of families is once you've been checking for at least, like insurance usually requires you to check four times a day for at least six to eight weeks. The question comes up is whether or not a continuous glucose monitor or CGM is right for you. And there are disadvantages and advantages for both, depending on where you are at that moment. So the advantages are there's alarms for high and low blood sugars. And so you are being, you can tell what's happening and, and parents can tell what's happening. But I also put that in the disadvantages column because there are alarms. And sometimes families, um, it's one more thing that they hear. And as we're adjusting doses, sometimes there's a lot, there could be some alarm fatigue, but still, I always believe the more information you have, the better we can do to treat the disease. You can see blood glucose trends. It will graph the numbers for you. And so you can see if the blood sugars are going up at a certain time period or going down at a certain time. There's remote access to data. The parents can watch from afar. And there are fewer pokes. And the disadvantages, there's comfort. So there is something on your skin. It's a very small catheter that goes under your skin but the kids do have to get used to you wearing it. Once they start wearing it, most families, most kids do not have an issue with it, especially when they realize they do not have to be poked as much. It is slightly extra work. The disc or the Dexcom has to be replaced every um, 10 to 14 days, and sometimes it will come off in a non-opportune time. And so families have to be ready to be able to do this. And then the cost. So it's being better covered for insurance for individuals with type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but it's still not considered standard of care. And so sometimes, depending on the insurance, um, coverage can be an issue. So treatment is insulin, and you give insulin for carbohydrates. We do not give it for fat or protein, but fat and protein do play a, a, um, a role in how we treat uh, the carbohydrates. And so this is a typical blood sugar pattern for most people um, with diabetes. As soon as they have breakfast, blood sugar goes up, lunch, dinner, and this is just um, one example. And so how we treat it is usually with at least two types of insulin. If the blood sugars are high, especially overnight, we treat with a long-acting insulin, which is called Lantus, Lavamir, Basic Large Perceba. All of these are different name brands, and we usually tell families it's Coke versus Pepsi. Whichever one your insurance covers is what we want to use. It's a steady release with no peak, and it lasts about 22 to 24 hours. And then we have to treat the individual spikes. And so that one we use Humalog, Novolog, Pedra, Amalog, Lispro. It starts working within 5 to 15 minutes. It peaks within 1 to 3 hours, and it lasts about 3 to 5 hours with the majority of people lasting about three hours. And so what we ask 
individuals to do is check a blood sugar pre-meal, figure out how many carbohydrates they're about to eat, and then figure out if they need to correct their blood sugar, and then they will give that shot for that amount. Um, again, all of this is personalized, and we would have to decide how what you need. Some individuals only need the short acting, some individuals only need the long acting, and some need both. And then we would also have to cover snacks. If an individual is on two feeds, there may be another insulin called NPH, which we give on top of that to man help manage the two feeds. So nutrition, we still recommend high calorie, high salt, fat, and not carbohydrate restricted. So even though we are counting carbohydrates, we are not asking you to restrict carbohydrates. We are just trying to figure out a way to match the carbohydrates with the insulin. And so an example of this is that we will tell you that you'll need one unit for every 15 grams of carbs. So if a person's eating a 30 gram banana, they will need two, grams, two units of insulin. And so families are taught how to use the math to do the math to determine insulin doses because that allows families to have freedom. And so the old style of giving insulin at a certain time and eating a certain amount every single time, we're not doing that with our young um, with our children or our young adults anymore, or even the older or the, or the older adults, because we want you to have the freedom to eat what you want when you want. But we do ask if there's possible to try to eat every three hours because that's around the time the insulin stops working. Um, we try to we try to limit concentrated sugars because that spikes the blood sugar up really fast and it doesn't match insulin well. And so that sometimes leads to low blood sugars. And the goal is really to allow the carbs being eaten to be maximally absorbed. because That's what insulin does. It absorbs the carbohydrates. So when you look at nutrition goals compared to type 1 and type 2 diabetes, they're different. So in type 1 diabetes, these individuals are growing and we just want them to have a normal, healthy diet with normal amount of carbohydrates. Individuals with type 2 diabetes, we want you, we do actually sometimes limit carbohydrates due to weight issues. And in CFRD, the recommendations are to continue what is needed for CF, um, and, they are, and the individualized carbohydrates maintain a G glycemic control. And they say artificial sweeteners should be used sparingly due to low calorie content. But I want you to know that our kids with diabetes are allowed to eat and drink what is a, like as needed. And so we do not stop them from getting the treats. And so this is an example, especially for the fall, it's a pumpkin spice latte. But what we say is if you're gonna get a drink, you need to figure out your carbohydrates. You can see the short um, pumpkin spice latte at Starbucks is 27 grams. And when you get all the way up to venti, it's 66 grams. And so you would have to figure out how much insulin you would need depending on the drink or the food that you eat. And I will, and I defer to the pulmonary dietitians to figure out what is appropriate amount of nutrition is needed. Insulin delivery choices is one thing that um, is also very personalized. When you first get diagnosed with diabetes, we teach them how to use an insulin vial and a syringe because that is something you can find across the world. However, we often will send you home with what we call insulin pens. And so this has the insulin in the cartridge and a dial right here. And so if you're gonna dial four units, you click it up to four units and then you give it into the skin using a small pen needle. And then if you would like, and you have enough insulin needs, then we can talk about insulin pumps. There are three different types of pumps on the market that we support. Each of them have their bells and whistles and each of them are specific to what um, like what like we they can be specific to what you need. So this one is called the Omnipod. It's a tubeless pump, meaning that you put the insulin in this device and you, you run the insulin through the PDM. These are both tube pumps and I'll show you a picture of what they look like in a second. This um, pump has uh, the continuous glucose monitor on the screen as well as this one because it actually talks to the continuous glucose monitor. They both react to those blood sugars. And that can be a, maybe what you need at a time or maybe not. And the insulin is sitting in a cartridge right at the bottom of the pump. So these are what the pumps look like. So the pod is sitting right on the skin. This is a pump site. And then here's the pump, same thing for this one too. 
This is another continuous glucose monitor, which is specific to this pump. So you replace the site every three days, um, approximately depending on your insulin doses. So the issue is that this needs to be disconnected when you shower or if you go swimming. This one does not. And we would teach you all this depending on what you would like to do. So is a pump right for you? Again, advantages and disadvantages. Advantages include improved blood sugar control, in theory, because you can dose for a very small amount of insulin using a pump. Fewer shots are by far the most um, cited reason for starting pumps. The insulin is on your body, so it's available and convenient, and you can dose by, by pressing a couple buttons. You can adjust the insulin doses for exercise and illness. If you have a snack, you can dose right in there. You don't have to go grab the insulin from your bag. And the data is stored in the pump. And that's really important because we can download the pump and get the information and help adjust the doses based on what um, the blood sugar show. But there are also disadvantages. And a lot of it is physical, logistical, and psychological because you do have to have something attached to you and you cannot lose it. Um, the pump itself is something that you just switch out the cartridges with a pump you commit to for about four years. This is the same thing with comfort like as a CGM and the extra work of having to replace the site. There is a risk for skin infections, although we teach you how to keep the site very clean. And this is very similar to a, the IVs that you would get in the hospital. Cost is also an issue, although I will say that we have had better coverage for pumps by far than CGMs. And then you have to switch out your infusion sites and set. So when you also hear about diabetes, you hear about complications. And unfortunately, individuals with CFRD are not um, immune to this. And so we have to be careful about this as well. So in CFRD, so both type 1 and type diabetes can have all different types of complications. In CFRD, we don't know if macrovascular complications are happening. Um, some do, but it's not as common as in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And macrovascular macro complications include heart disease, stroke, peripheral artery disease. We do know that microvascular complications can happen if diabetes is not well controlled. And microvascular complications are the kidney disease, the eye disease, and the nerve disease. So again, another reason to be very aggressive in treating diabetes. And so what we ask for you once you are diagnosed with diabetes is a close relationship, communicating with us in between visits. We see you every three months, and at that th every three months, we will get an A1C, and we'll monitor blood pressure and get um, cholesterol panels as needed and screen for complications. But in between the visits, if numbers don't look right, it's very common for families to send us numbers. And so we just have to have an open um, conversation. And then, of course, we recommend exercise for all of our kids, regardless of whether or not um, where they are in their diabetes. And so I thank you for letting me come and talk about diabetes, and I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Thomas. That was very educational. Um, I just have a couple of questions. The first one, I think, is for you, and the second one may be for Dr. Nasser or Dr. Simon. Uh, but the first one is I'm wondering, you know, with CF um, diet, high fat, high protein, high carb, is there any way, I really don't want to do insulin, is there any way that changing my diet would be beneficial for someone with CFRD? No, I wish we could do that. So insulin takes the carbohydrates or the glucose that comes from the food and puts it into the cell. So in an individual with CFRD, the, the insulin production is not enough to use pills. And then changing the diet will reduce the calories entered, and again, nutrition is going to be very important. Um, so even for all our individuals with type, with type 1 and CFRD, we say nutrition is very important. We will work with you with what you need. But reducing your carbohydrates usually leads to poor Waking. Thank you. And then the other question was in, you know, the age of all these modulators, do we have any information on if Trikafta has any benefit with CFRD? 
the question is actually, does TRICAFTA reverse CFRD? Um, but I'm wondering if we've seen any of that information in the adult population. Yeah, I don't know. So, if, I think everyone's are... really hopeful. Dick, you can go I ahead. think everyone's very hopeful. I don't think adults as much, so. Yeah, the, there's active studies going on where they've taken patients and done a whole set of studies, including their insulin uh, secretion levels and blood sugars, and then with the intent to repeat them after they've been on Trikafta for a number of months to see if it changes. So we should be knowing that, but it may take another year to have it. But there's certainly reason to hope that if you can start it early enough, you might delay, and we all hope avoid diabetes. But whether it will take someone and reverse insulin requiring diabetes, I'm doubtful, but we can always hope. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Thomas, again. And Dr. Nasser, I'll let you go ahead and introduce our next speaker.